I want to mention one thing about our one call system. Uh, several of you were not getting calls at all, and I talked to them on the phone this week, and they suspected that all of our uh, anti spam blockers and all that was playing havoc with the toll free number. So the number that will appear on your display now is the old church number that we've had for decades, uh, 446 number. Um, if you want to save that, then, it, then it'll just be one call now or whatever you save it as. Uh, but several of you have said, I got the call. <laughs> so uh, they were apparently right, and that's the reason. Now, if for some reason you did not get the call, uh, you may need that in your contacts. So you'll want to save our actual church number in the place of the uh, previous one call number. So that's technology at its finest, what can we say? I want us to uh, continue a second week uh, uh, kind of taking a step back view or a top down view of uh, the forces that are in play around us as we uh, try to live our lives as Christians. We're calling it the heavenly places based on the passages in Ephesians that describe the realm in which God dwells, the realm in which we walk, and by the way, the realm in which some other beings and creatures are also playing havoc. Those uh, creatures are known as rulers, powers, world forces of this darkness, and spiritual forces of wickedness. That verse is Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that we read last week. Let me read it again. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, if you don't want to believe in spiritual forces, it's difficult to explain this verse because he says it is not flesh and blood. Normally, we see the word rulers. It's talking about a governmental authority. But he says it's not flesh and blood that we're dealing with. So that's not the answer. That's not the complete picture, as, uh, as we're told. Now, I want to I go back to Proverbs. <laughs> if you go with me to Proverbs 6, uh, there is a description of wickedness. We're going to talk about wickedness and evil today. And notice how this verse kind of creeps up on you, <laughs> okay? A worthless person, a wicked man is the one who talks with a perverse mouth, who winks with his eyes, who signals with his feet, who points with his fingers, who with perversity in his heart continually devises evil, who spreads strife. Now you look at those actions and you say, wait a minute, that doesn't seem particularly evil to me, but... As it begins to develop, you can see all of these signals, all of these actions with various parts of the body. He's basically, he's cooking up a way to deceive or cooking up a way to uh, do something wrong and bring others into it. And it will result in evil and it will result in people not getting along with each other. And then he goes on to say in, in the next several verses, 16 through 19, there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. These are maybe not the evil list that you expected. In fact, you might read that list and say, wait a minute, I've done that. Well, what we've learned as, as I've looked through the scriptures, the word evil is applied to sin. It's applied to anything against God. It's applied to anything against God's will. And yeah, Romans will later say, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the truth is, that means by definition that all of us have done evil. In fact, if I made a list of the people who have done evil in the scriptures, I'd start with Adam. <laughs> Get the idea? 
And when I got through, you'd feel like I'd named everyone in the Bible. And I think that's what Romans was trying to say. I would have. Because doing evil is simply crossing God. Doing something that he uh, does not like, does not approve of, and says not to do. Let me think of it this way with you. Evil starts small. But the wise man Solomon says, evil makes you worthless. Think about the friends you have. Do you value them? Do you look at this person and say, I'm a better person because I'm around this person? Do you value that relationship? Then think about the things that we've been reading and say, what if they treated me like these things? What if they treated me horribly? Would I value that relationship then? And, and you know, the answer is no. Because wickedness makes us worthless. We're not of any value to someone else, and they don't value us because we act that way. And that's the problem. I want to go back into the New Testament uh, to the words of Jesus. I'm going to use Mark uh, chapter 7. It's also in the other Gospels. In Mark chapter 7, there's a dispute about whether, I know, whether you should wash your hands. I guess you had to be there. Jesus' answer follows, and then we'll go back and look at the reason for that. Jesus says, it is from within, out of the heart of men. They proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile a man. Now the question was whether if you don't wash your hands, are you defiled? Are you a dirty person? Jesus says, you know, <laughs> rules don't produce righteousness. So you can't just go wash your hands and say, okay, I'm pure. <laughs> that, I wash my hands, I'm pure. So the problem is you washed your hands, but what happened to your heart during that washing? Was there any cleansing going on inside as a result of trying to be pure before God? The rule keeping won't make you righteous. In fact, you can think while you're washing your hands all kinds of nasty, dirty things. And you're an evil person at that point. You're doing evil. Look at the list broken down just a little bit. I'm not going to go into great, great detail here, but fornication deprives us of purity. Theft deprives us of possessions. Murder, of course, takes a life, and it always affects a family. Adulteries destroys marriages. And deceit hides the truth and uses it usually to steal or deceive in some other way. Then when he says coveting and wickedness, that's, that's wanting things that are evil. <laughs> And he mentions sensuality. That's someone who just has no restraint. They just, they want what they want and just get out of my way. Here I come. Envy is actually the word in Greek for an evil eye. <laughs> Not the one that people give you, the one you give to others. But evil eye in the sense of things that I want. Oh, I want that. And the eye goes to that, and then the mind is consumed with that, and then the body has to have that. Envy. Slander, of course, is an evil tongue, saying, you know, strife among brothers, as, as Solomon said. Pride is an inflated ego. I think so much of myself that, well, I want to do what I want to do because I am, I'm just so powerful. <laughs> I'm just so important. I'm going to do what I want. And a person who's foolish is someone who lacks judgment. They can't think through any of this because they're acting foolishly. And that's another word for evil. Now, I don't know if I've activated your defenses any. <laughs> that, if I have, that's a result of what temptation does to us. And in James, he's very clear there's something we should not say when we're tempted. 
Let no one say, when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So again, we think of evil, basically it is a spiritual force that exists in the heavenly places, and it invades our heart and entices us to do other things. I choose to do what I want to do. Without regard for you, without regard for someone else, without regard for God. Lust, sin, death. It's a three-step process to losing everything. And it starts with my desire in my heart, according to James. That's how these spiritual forces come to play on us personally and individually. And so I'm trying to say there's a spiritual force out there, but you can't blame the spirits if you act in evil ways. You can only blame yourself for listening to the arguments that are presented or the things that you want because of what you know. As Scripture presents evil to us, we're told about a couple of times when God acted in a powerful way to get rid of evil. This isn't the one you might be thinking of. Romans chapter 1 discusses what God did in a more general way as He dealt with people through the ages. And I'm in the middle of a passage, but verse 28 says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. So see, I I don't care what God says. I want to do what I want to do. God gave them over to a depraved mind, to do things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, not a small thing without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. There are 24 things in that few verses. 24 things. And it's pretty much, as you might remember, the same list that I read for you earlier. And it actually coincides pretty well with the list of things God hates. I mean, God's pretty consistent. He, he, he knows what He doesn't like. He knows what He doesn't want to exist. And He knows what's fighting against us as we try to listen to Him. But there's kind of a two-step process here. I choose myself over God. I don't care to acknowledge Him anymore. And what that creates in me is what Paul calls a depraved mind. A mind that's really kind of incapable of doing good things. A mind that's incapable of thinking good things. That, that when you get a moment, man, things go crazy in your mind and it's not good. And when you get some time on your hands, what you want to go do is not good. And it's almost like you can't. And then that takes you to the place where it's not enough for you to go do those things. you got to be a cheerleader for everybody else that can act as bad as you are. Uh, that's, what we, that's called the news media. <laughs> you know, uh, If it's evil, it's probably on the news. And it might even be on the news with a recommendation and approval. And telling you you're narrow-minded and old-fashioned and religious or something if you don't agree. That's the depravity of the mind and what happens when evil is allowed to control. Let me say it this way. God is ignored. God is displeased. 
do, can you believe these last three words? God gives up. He gave them over. That's kind of hard to imagine. That's really not the God we think of when we think of the God who loves and pursues and chases us after us and all that. But God doesn't always do that. There is a point when if you don't want Him and you only want to do things that make Him sad, He can walk away from that. Actually, you walked away from Him because <laughs> He's everywhere. But it's a, it's a process. Now, maybe the thing you were thinking about was Genesis 6. I just want to read one verse. Right before the flood, well, 120 years before the flood, God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, for those of you who say, it's never been this bad. Yeah, it has. It was so bad, God said, there's not enough good on the earth for me to save it. I'm just going to destroy it with water. Not that we're, you know, anxious to try to, you know, be number one in this category. This is not a category I want to win in. It was worse then. It really was. It can get to that point. And again, I just want to remind us about what we read last week in Ephesians 2. Among them you too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. We cannot say evil is out there in the world. It is not in my heart. It is not in my church. Evil is out there and it's in here. And when I say in here, I don't only mean this room. I mean in here in my heart and yours. Because that's where sin breaks out. And we all sin. So, let me come back and say God gave up. God can't go anywhere. <laughs> He's already there. God remains. He remains and, and He may not be with us because we've left Him. But His love has not changed. And that's why sin displeases him. Sin makes him heart sick. It's not an angry God shaking his fist at you because you sin. It's, it makes him heart sick to watch us destroy ourselves. He knows where this road leads. How many million times has he watched it happen? Evil is out there. It's in here. God remains. So the solution to evil, according to Romans 12, the way to overcome evil is with good. Did you expect something different? Let me define good as God. And let me say that God is way ahead of us. You know, as a parent, if you, if you look at your children and they begin doing certain things, you go, oh, I know where this is leading. <laughs> oh, I've been down this road myself. I've watched them go down this road. I've seen other kids go down this road. I know where this goes. Well, God is way ahead of us too. I want to close this with the story of the prodigal son. I'm just going to read a few verses. Luke 15, if you want to have it open in your lap. The son came to the father and said, I want everything that's mine. And he went and he spent it. And everybody else that said they were his friends spent it for him. By the way, if you don't know people like that, stay away from them. You'll be broke and they'll be gone. That's what happened to him. And he is trying to eat. And so he goes into a pig pen to feed the pigs. But some of what he was trying to feed the pigs, which was half-eaten corn husks and things like that, he thought, you know, it, it's food, right? Right? Pigs eat it, I guess I can. And then he came to his senses. If you're in a pig pen, and you think pig food is your food, you're crazy. You've lost it. But sometimes, you have to get to the bottom. The verse right ahead of this says, and no one gave him anything. 
that's a whole other sermon. He came to his senses and he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. I'd rather be a slave than in a pig pen. Smart. <laughs> God is way ahead of us. So, he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran, embraced him, and kissed him. Is that what you thought it was going to say? I'll tell you what. Is that your God? It's not the God of the Bible. This is the father who ran. He ran to meet his son. He's so far ahead of us, he knows those feelings and thoughts in our heart that are really not doing us any favors and might even actually keep us away from him. He wants to make sure that doesn't take hold. Let me show you how much I love you, he says. I don't care what you've done. Turning our head toward home changes everything. If you've been in a pig pen and things aren't going great, there's nowhere to look but up and out of that. And what you need to know is that your look is home. Your look is to a father who is good. And good can overcome evil. Good can convince you this is no way to live. Good can convince you that even this can be overcome. We read it last week, Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And now we've gone full circle. The heavenly places contain evil. They can also contain you and me. Because we've been raised. We've been seated. The party has begun. The angels are rejoicing. Luke 15. And grace wins. Because God is good and God is more powerful than evil. I want to ask you to stand. I have one more passage in Isaiah, and we're going to have the invitation, but I, I want you to stand for this passage. Read it with me. But now, thus says the Lord, your Creator, O Jacob, and He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. If you can find something better than that, go. That's what you come to. It's your turn to go home. Turn your head, turn your heart, and come to the Father right now while we sing.